He is risen. He is risen Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I'm going to make a sort of, of a bold statement, although not surprising given the video we just saw, but Easter changes everything. I mean, it literally does. But just to kind of set the scene for today, when last we met, it was Good Friday, and everything went horribly wrong. We watched Jesus die on the cross, and the disciples were freaked out, and they fled, and they, they watched their Lord be tried in these three illegal trials in the middle of the night in the morning. They watched him go before Pilate, and they saw weak leadership, and they let Pilate just wash his hands of the whole deal and have Jesus sentenced to die on the cross. They watched the whole thing transpire, and the Saturday after, they're just hiding in fear. Fear that the Jews are going to come after them. Fear that the one that they hoped would change everything. And remember, they thought Jesus was going to change everything. It wasn't just forgiveness that they were focused on. It was, man, he was going to set up his kingdom. I mean, even as they're walking to Jerusalem, James and John's mom is like, hey, could they sit your left and right in your new kingdom? I mean, they thought he was going to change everything. And you start thinking, well, what's everything? Well, political system was a mess. Every few years, the Romans would send in a new regent that would oversee that land and he put down riots, sometimes, often with a, kind of a heavy hand to kind of show who he's boss as he comes into the new area. He had some people who watched Herod kill everybody that he knew and, and rule with an iron fist, and they were hoping his son would be different. His son was different, at least at the beginning. I mean, he rebuilt the temple, and people were optimistic, and they were hopeful that maybe at least with this new Herod, he would be better. He kind of devolved into a sort of a playboy that was interested in spiritual things, but also interested in just about everything else. They started to lose hope that things would ever change. There was riots and all sorts of factions trying to, I don't know, overtake the Roman thing, even though they knew it was impossible. They had a two-tiered judicious system at the time. He had the Romans, and they had one rule of law, and for everybody else, there was a secondary law. And then in Jerusalem, they had a third law, you know, which the church kind of oversaw, and they would do different things. The church had lost its focus on Jesus, didn't they? Lost its focus on the Messiah, lost its focus on the truth, and as it did, it devolved into murder and all sorts of blasphemy and hatred. The disciples were not just in fear, they were grieving, this was the guy that was going to change everything, and now he's dead. This was the one that they put their hope in, and now he's gone. And on Easter morning, everything changed. On Easter morning, they saw that he was able, that he was who he said he was, that he actually had fixed everything. And he gave them a renewed hope and a renewed strength and a renewed optimism about the future that ultimately changed the world. I share all that because I think in the context of today, sometimes I'll, ask, I'll just ask you this question, where do you look for hope today? If you get sick, you look for hope to the doctors that maybe the doctors will fix it. If you don't like what's going on, you look to the next election and hope, well, maybe the new guy will do better than the old guy. And you're always hoping the new guy does better. And... You look to the judicious system and you're thinking, man, I hope, I hope justice prevails in this because that's not always what we see. And as things have turned and if things have gotten more murky and if things have gotten crazier in our world, the hopelessness of our world has gotten greater and greater and greater. Then you think, well, let's look to the church, but as the church in our world today has lost its way and lost its focus on Christ and lost its focus on the truth, you go to church and you don't find that truth and that strength and that hope in Jesus. You lose focus. You lose the one that changes everything. But maybe you're asking, what exactly does he change, you know, as we go through this life? And I guess because he's been in the news lately, I was kind of remembering back to that right after we were married, there was this uh, mega star rap star named Puff Daddy. Anybody remember Puff Daddy? He's been in the news recently. <laughs> Anyway, back in 2001, I guess, he was going through some tough times. He had a court case. He broke up with Jennifer Lopez. I don't know if you remember that. He, then he got in a traffic violation, changing lanes too quickly in his scooter. It had been a tough year in old Puff. And so what did Puff do? Puff Daddy announced to the world that he was changing his name. He needed an image change, and he wanted the whole world to know that he was now different. So he changed his name to P. Diddy, right? So that, that was to let them know that he's different now. 
But what's funny is in 2005, after another eventful year, he decided to be called just Diddy. And then in 2008, he announced that he was going to be called by the name Sean Jean, which is what you see in the papers today. In 2011, he changed his name again for just a week to Swag. I didn't remember that. In 2017, the rapper announced that he was going to be called by the name Brother Love. And then finally, in 2021, just a few years ago, he changed his middle name officially to Love. What's his name now? No, nobody really cares, right? But it's just... Uh, <laughs> Actually, in the newspaper, it says Sean Diddy Combs instead of Sean Love Combs. But you start to ask, well, why does he keep changing his name? And he tells us every single time. It's to let us know that now he's different somehow. And again, I remember marveling back after we, sort of after we got married when he did that. And I guess just marveling ever since. I said, wouldn't it be cool if it was just that easy? You know, if we could just change our name and somehow that changed our character and all of a sudden things would be different moving forward. Just got to change your name and everything will be better. How easy that would be. But it's never quite that simple, is it? Sure wasn't for old Puff as he continues to be in the news cycles. I wonder if he'll change his name again shortly. I don't know. But why is that? Why, why isn't it that we can just change things like that? Don't, don't you wish you could? Are the things that you've been working on changing your life and you just haven't been able to do it? Think diet. Think whatever. I mean, think of those things that we want to change and we just can't quite change and we change it for a week and then it, doesn't, you know, it goes back and forth. Truth is, as you go to scripture, it says that change, serious change, change that actually works, always starts in the mind, not in your body or your behavior. I think that's an interesting thing. It starts always in the way that you think. That's where diets work. Think about going to the doctor and all of a sudden he tells you, if you don't change this, you're going to die. That's usually the visit that all of a sudden changes our behavior, isn't it? Why? Because he's changed the way we thought. We thought we were getting away with it. Turns out we were wrong. And so now we finally make the changes we've been trying to make for forever. Why? Because the way we think has finally changed things. Most of the time, for whatever reason, though, we think if we want to change for the better, we just need to change something external about ourselves, right? And that will make all the difference. So, like, I change the way I do my hair, maybe. It's not too many different ways now anymore, but change the clothes that I wear, the car that I drive, or, you know, the way that I look. And that will automatically change me on the inside. I mean, isn't that what all the movies tell us? You just got to change the way you look. Especially in high school, if I can just change the way I dress or the hairstyle that I have, everything will be better. But it doesn't always, actually, it hardly ever works out that way, does it? Because no matter how many externals you change, you're still the same person on the inside. Still got the same issues, still got the same fears, still got the same worries, still got the same situations. So changing the externals never really changes us. And that's why God wants to tell us this morning that if you seriously want to change, you've got to work on the inside first. And that's really the, the cool part about Easter is that's what Easter is all about, isn't it? So changing you on the inside. I want you to think about when Jesus rose from the dead, did the, all of a sudden the political system change? No. Did the judicial system change? No. Did the church all of a sudden focus on Christ back then? The Jewish church? No. But the disciples were ecstatic. They realized that he was who he said he was. That he could do anything. That he could forgive anything. That he could give them hope again and peace in the midst of the storms and strength to keep on fighting and to keep on sharing. He could change everything that matters and they gave their lives to him and they shared their belief in him and it changed the world. But God says if you want to experience that peace and that, that strength and that hope and that forgiveness and that power, you got to be able to open three things. And this is sort of the Easter challenge today. But I think it, as you look at our world today, there's application here that we forget these things over and over and over, and that's why we struggle, and that's why we too, even the people here, sometimes struggle with hopelessness and stress or in looking to the wrong people or wrong situations to find hope. One of the first things he says then is we must be able to open our minds to God's power. Moses was leading a bunch of people through the desert and they were crying out for meat. If you know the story, they were crying out for a lot of stuff. They got frustrated often, and they were complaining. And, and Lord, he goes to the Lord in prayers, and he prays about it, and says, Lord, what am I going to do with all this? And God says, well, give them meat. And he's like, what are, you, what are you talking about? I mean, if we were to kill all the animals in the world, we'd have enough meat for these guys? This is insane. We're in the middle of the desert. And God says, is my arm too short? I, in other words, do you think my power is enabled? Do you think that I can't do this? He goes, Watch. 
And God supplies all these pigeons and feeds them for years or 40 years and gives them meat every single day. The truth is, if we don't open our, our minds to God's power, then we limit stuff to ourselves. And we find out very quickly that we can't control much. And the people that we place our hope in, have you ever, have you ever experienced the medical system and, and realized they are just practicing medicine? You want them to be experts, but they're still trying stuff. You want our leaders to be people that do things for our good, but they're still just trying stuff. You want the judicial system to be perfect, but again, they're still just human beings. But if you want to change your mind, if you want to open your mind to God's power, you've got to change the way you think first. The Bible says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Or maybe another way to say it is that you just don't do it by trying harder. You know what the average length of a New Year's resolution is? Two weeks. That's about how long our willpower lasts. And then after about two weeks, we're like, oh, we're done with this. I can't do this anymore. And we give up. But God says, you change your life by changing the way you think, by opening your mind to the possibility of God. What do I mean by the possibility of God? The possibility that he actually exists. The possibility that he actually loves you more than you can comprehend. Opening your mind to the possibility that he might know everything about your life and care about it. That he has the power that you don't have to solve the issues that you haven't been able to, to figure out. And that you can tap into that power so that you can finally make the changes that you've been wanting to make for years. It starts by opening your mind up to the possibility that he's real, that he exists, that he loves you, and he wants to help you as you go through this life. Kind of as an example of that, see if you can finish this sentence. I don't think I'll ever be able to blank. I'll, I'll fill in some of it. I don't think I'll ever get married again. I don't think I'll ever get married. I don't think I'll ever forget the person who hurt me. I don't think I'll ever be able to forgive them. I don't think I'll ever be able to get over that hurt. I don't think I'll ever be able to get a fresh start. I don't think I'll ever see the fulfillment of this dream that I've always had. And it's the midlife crisis. You know, when we start kind of going into that way of thinking, it's because we're looking at the situation always from our point of view and not from God's point of view. From the human perspective, I'm telling you, there's a lot of stuff that's just impossible. I, I can't fix the politics of our country. I wish I could. I just don't know how. I don't know how I would even begin to do that. I can't fix the, the cancer that my mother-in-law is struggling with. I just don't know how. I can't, I can't fix it. There's so many things in my life that I just don't have the power to change, and so I'm trying to figure out how to best navigate life in the midst of it. But I don't have the power. But God does. And God can do literally anything. And when we remember that, all of a sudden we have hope. All of a sudden there's life to, to figure that somehow, some way, God can intervene in the midst of whatever, and He can do the impossible. But God is able. I mean, let's face it, we've tried everything already anyway, and we keep finding ourselves going back to the same destructive habits, whether it be our ways of thinking, our fear, our worry, our destructive habits that we are involved in. But if you just look at it from God's perspective, all of a sudden you would realize and see that God has the power that you don't have. That's why we've been praying as a church really all year, right, for our country. Because it's a mess. Anybody disagree with that? It's a mess. And so we've been praying, praying that, that our leaders would become more godly, praying that they would use more and more scripture as the fulcrum to decide different things, praying that they would make more and more good decisions that benefit the people trying to do things that are good. When you start looking at it from God's perspective, all of a sudden you see that God is able and he can do things. And when you open your mind up to the power of God, you start realizing the incredible things that he can do that you never thought possible. Paul says it this way. He says, I pray that you'd begin to understand, right, how incredibly great God's power is to help those who believe in him. It's the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. In other words, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead all those years back, 2,000 plus years ago, right, is the same power available to you to make the changes in your life today. God has the power to raise the dead, bring a dead person back to life, and he certainly has the power to raise a dead marriage or a dead career or a dead dream. I mean, God can do anything, but here's the key. It says, I pray that you'll understand. Again, it always starts in our thinking how great God's power is if you really want to change your life for the better, then you need to open up yourselves to this new understanding. It starts with a new perspective. It starts with opening your mind up to the power of God. 
And then all of a sudden you have hope when you're watching the news. And all of a sudden you have hope when you're sitting in the doctor's office. And all of a sudden you have hope as you're struggling through your marriage. And all of a sudden you have hope because even though I can't by myself fix this, I know I have a God that is able. But it's more than that, isn't it? It's also opening up our hearts to God's grace. Grace is kind of a churchy word. I usually define it as God's undeserved love toward us. We don't deserve it, but he loves us anyway, right? But grace is such a multifaceted term that actually has a lot of different definitions to it. And so I'll give you a few more. Grace is when God gives you what you need instead of what you deserve. That's grace. Grace is when God forgives you even before you ask. That's grace. Grace is when God says, come home, I'm not mad at you anymore. (laughs) That's grace. Grace is when God forgives you and gives you a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth and a thousandth chance. And he forgives you in all the in-betweens. Grace is the power God gives you to make the changes in your life that you could never make on your own. Kind of imbues you with the power to make these changes that you've been stumbling through. And here's the thing. We all need grace in our life. We all need that forgiveness in our life. We all need that new beginning in our life. We all need that fresh start. God says we need to open our hearts to God's grace as well. But just like the power thing, I think we struggle with that because we don't see grace modeled for us very much in this world. In fact, I came across a, a, a kind of an illustration with that. There's a guy named Dave Hagler who used to be a referee and an umpire, and he wrote this article in the LA Times. He says, I was driving too fast in the snow one day in Boulder, Colorado, when a police officer pulled me over and gave me a speeding ticket. I tried to talk him out of it, telling him how worried I was about my insurance going up and how careful a driver I normally was. I begged him for grace. I begged him, he said. But he said, if I didn't like it, I could just take it to court. Well, the first game of the next baseball season came in, and I was umpiring behind home plate, and the first batter up was this same policeman. I recognized him, and he recognized me. And he nervously asked me, hey, how did that ticket thing go? He said, I just stared at him. And then I said, swing at everything. (laughs) (laughs) Truth is, we don't normally experience grace from other people, so it's hard for us to picture God as a God who just forgives. But the Bible says God is different. God will accept us, it says. He will acquit us, declare us not guilty for all the things that we've ever done wrong in this life. If we would just trust Jesus to take away our sins. And we can all be saved in the same way by coming to Christ no matter who we are or what we've been like, the scriptures say. This is another one of those etch-a-sketch verses of the Bible. I don't know if you guys remember that, but you'd kind of draw with these little knobs and you make these things, although never as good as on the commercial, and then you mess up inevitably and you turn it over and you could start over again because it wipe it clean. And just looking out at the crowd, I can say I lost half of you. So it's like the delete button on your computer, right? It's, and the delete button's a magical thing for anybody who's 54 years old or older, right? I was talking to my kids the other day about, um, I had to do that term paper in, in high school and and I had to do it on a typewriter. And I said, it was brutal. And the way you fix mistakes is you had to take this little white stuff and you had to like glue it out and then you had to retype it and it was horrible and you had to get it just right and it couldn't be off center. And, uh, and if the teacher didn't accept that, you had to retype the whole page. It was just a nightmare. The delete button is magical. It's magical for texting. It's magical for t- emailing. It's magical for papers. You just delete everything that you just wrote that was stupid and then you can start over again. It's It's awesome. You make a mess and you can turn it over and begin again. You come to God and he says, you know what, I want to do the same thing. I want to wipe the slate clean from everything that you've ever done wrong in your life. Can you imagine that kind of reset? I want to forgive you. And when God forgives, it's complete. He doesn't bring it back up in the future and say, hey, about what you did. He says, no, what I choose to forgive, I also choose to forget. I want to renew you. I want to offer you a peace and a strength and a hope that you've not had. In fact, thousands of years before you were born, God knew that you'd be here in Phoenix, Arizona today in Easter. I mean, and if you can wrap your minds around that, he brought you here today so that he gets you to sit still long enough just to hear this. God says to you, you matter to him. That he cares about your life. That he loves you more than you understand. And that he's working He's working to bring you closer to him so that you can be with him forever in heaven. He can also says, I've seen everything that's gone on in your life. I know where there's brokenness and hardship. I know where there's fear and pain. I know all of your struggles and all of your celebrations. But I want you to know in those hard things, you can start over. If you'll let me, I'll help you every step of the way. 
And then he gives us one more thing. We need to learn to open our life to God's love. I keep telling you that he loves you more than you can comprehend, but it's, I think, hard for us sometimes because the world doesn't do it that way. No one else will ever love you more than God does. Paul says this way, I pray that Christ will live in you as you open the door talking about your life and invite him in. And that you'll be able to feel and understand how long and how wide and how deep and how high his love for you really is. And that you would experience this love for yourself. And that's my prayer for you today. That you would experience the love of God in your life in a very real and personal way. That you not just know it in your mind. I mean, you've heard people say God loves you, right? But if you've never felt it, you've never been transformed by it. Scripture says that he has forgiven little, loves little. But if you've never experienced that love, you've not been transformed. It's only when you experience it, when you feel the love of God, that he starts changing that inside stuff, that he starts transforming you. So we need to open our life to God's love so that you can feel it. Try to think of a way to, to paint you a picture with this that maybe helps you understand it better. Jenny grew up in a cherry orchard near Traverse City, Michigan. Her parents, a little old-fashioned, tended to overreact to her nose ring and her music and the way she dressed. One night in an argument with her father, she screamed, I hate you! I never want to see you again! And that night, she ran away, catching a bus to Detroit. The second day in Detroit, she met a man with the biggest car she'd ever seen. He'd offered her a ride, bought her lunch, and gave her a place to stay. He even gave her some pills that made her feel better than she'd ever felt in her life. And this good life continued for about a year. The man who she now also called boss taught her a few things that men like, and since she was underage, men would pay a premium for her. She lived in a penthouse and ordered room service whenever she wanted, but after a year she became ill, and her boss consequently became mean. Soon she was out on the streets without a penny to her name. The little bit of money she made turning tricks all went to support her habit. One freezing night on the streets, sleepless and hungry, Jenny was overwhelmed with a longing to go back home to the cherry orchards and the warm home and the golden retriever. Sobbing, she called home three times only to get an answering machine. The third time she said, Mom, Dad, it's me. I want to come home. I'm catching the bus and I'll get there about midnight tomorrow night at the station. If you're not there, I guess I'll just stay on the bus and go to Canada. On the seven-hour bus trip home, Jenny began to have doubts. What will I say? What will they think? Will they even show up? Will there be anybody there at the station? And the bus finally rolled into the small station. The driver announced, 15 minutes, folks. That's all the time we have here. 15 minutes. 15 minutes to decide the rest of her life. She nervously checked how she looked in the little compact mirror she had. And as she walked in the ter to the terminal, nothing could have prepared her for what she saw. Forty people standing there at midnight, uncles and aunts, cousins, brothers and sisters, mom and dad and grandparents, all of them with silly party hats on, blowing silly noisemakers and holding a banner that seemed to stretch the entire terminal that said, welcome home, sweetie. As her eyes filled with tears, her dad lunged forward out of the crowd to grab her. She said, oh, dad, I am so sorry. I... Her dad said, shh, we don't have time for apologies. We've got to take you to the party. We're going to be late. We planned a banquet for you at home. If you can get that picture, this is a picture of the unconditional love that God has for you. It's never too late with him. You, you can't blow it too far where God can't forgive and God can't renew, where God won't be there for you. And that's what Easter's all about. Easter is where Jesus gives us the power to start over. It's where he gives us the power to keep going and keep persevering in hard times. It's where he gives us the power to change and be different. It's where he says, I forgive you. I love you. You're mine. So Easter is not about the music or the crowds. It's really about a personal, intimate, personal change in you and me. And if you miss that, you miss the whole reason that Jesus came. It's about changing you on the inside, changing me on the inside. It's about his power. It's about his grace. It's about his forgiveness. It's about those fresh starts. It's about those new beginnings. It's about giving you hope as you go through this life, a peace as you deal with the storms of life, a strength to keep on going when it's hard in life, a realization that he's there, that he's real, that he cares, and that he loves you. So much he was willing to do anything. And that's how Easter changes everything. 
as we open up our hearts, we see him and we watch him change everything. So go with that today. Let me pray. God, we love you so much, and it's an awesome day. It's Easter. It's fun to see so many people here packing into the sanctuary. We need more chairs, a space, or whatever. But Father, we just thank you for you. We thank you for loving us the way you do, that you sent Jesus here in the first place. We thank you for Jesus' love for us, that even in spite of everything he had to go through over this last week, as we look back, that he did it because he knew that unless he did it that way, we couldn't be saved. Father, so today we do look at you as our Savior as the one that renews us, as the one that forgives us, as the one that strengthens us, as the one that does miracles for us, as the one that is always there for us, as the one that comforts us, as the one that loves us more than we can comprehend. So today we praise you, Lord, with all of our heart, and we pray it in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen.